and welcome to our December call for Women IT Pros, our last call of 2022. And what another odd year it's been, but a good year and you know, getting back on track with some of our Women IT Pro stuff. And today we have Lisa Elser, who's going to talk about skills of listening and learning, how to turn liberal arts into technical advantages. So uh, before we get started here, we do have a chat window for everyone who is live on the call. So feel free to type whatever you want in there and you know, we'll do some intros there. There may be some times when you're free to come off mute, although uh, we are recording. So if you don't want to be recorded, that's fine. You can just uh, uh, save it and at some point you know, we'll stop the recording and then you're free to come off and talk all you want. We also have a group on LinkedIn that's just called Women IT Pros. And if you ask to join that, we have a bunch of admins, so we'll get you added there pretty quickly. Upcoming Women IT Pros events. Uh, the Asia Pacific group is going to go ahead and meet in that last week of the year, and so is the US group in Altspace. So join them. Uh, it'll be Thursday, the 29th at noon in Brisbane time, which ends up being 6 o'clock on the 28th in Pacific time. And uh, so Jess and um, Sonia are going to talk about end of year shenanigans. So always fun. I, I think shenanigans and Jess, it just seems like it's got to be a great call there. And then uh, the US will be meeting in Altspace VR on uh, Friday, December 30th. So kind of almost the end of the year there. And we'll meet from 9 to 10. And you don't need a VR headset to join us. So uh, you can just pop on in using a, a Mac or a PC app. And then starting over again in 2023, our January call is going to have Holly Lehman, who is a former coworker of mine, amazing woman who's gone from law enforcement to hotel management into tech. And she just finished presenting at conferences kind of back to back in Europe and I think Las Vegas as well in the keynote. So, I mean, this woman is, is just on fire and uh, come and hear her story. And if you follow us on Eventbrite, then you can get all of the announcements to our events that are coming up. We have a survey at the end, and I will put that link and uh, some of the others here in our chat window. And I'll also put these links in the recording if you want to access any of them. Uh, if you're listening to the recording, feel free to pop over. Please give us an email. And I always like to start by saying that even though I do work for Microsoft and a lot of our guests work for Microsoft, some of our participants work for Microsoft, this is not an official Microsoft initiative. Uh, it's grassroots open source. We encourage everyone to go out there and, and try to bring women IT pros together. So uh, some intros in the chat window. If you can tell us who you are and why you're here. Uh, general area where you live and if there are any events that you're going to because even digital events you know we can actually like go to events together and if you're going to any in-person events let me know you know there's some things that we can do to help try to bring the women IT pros together at those events that don't cost any money and uh, can be a lot of fun if anybody would like to come off mute and introduce yourself uh, just know that it will be recorded I always make that available to you and uh, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Kathy Moya. I'm the chief instigator of Women IT Pros, and I run the, the US division of it. Uh, still looking for someone to take over Europe since that's uh, kind of fallen away a bit today. And uh, let's see, I'm uh, on social media as Kathy Loves Tech, C A T H Y. And I don't know about the events that I'm going to in 2023, so I need you all to tell me what are some good events to go check out other than, uh, you know, always going to the old space stuff. Anybody want to introduce themselves? Hi, Kathy, Lisa, everyone else. Um, I'm Priscilla. Um, I love coming to these meetings. I think they're awesome. So thanks for hosting them. Um, I'm a customer success engineer from Southern California. And what's the other question? My media contact is at LearnLeon at, for Twitter, uh, Priscilla Leon for my LinkedIn. And I don't have an Instagram. Um, I don't have any other events I'm planning on going to, I don't think, other than like the Women in IT Pros are usually the ones that, they're my go-to for sure. Thank you. Oh, it's yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks for doing this. Uh, Betsy? Hello, I'm Betsy Weber. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. I'm very excited for the topic today as it's something I always need to practice and, and learn more on. Um, I'm a senior uh, community program manager at Microsoft. Uh, I live in the middle of Michigan in, in East Lansing. Um, 
and I'll put my my Twitter contact and LinkedIn in chat. Great to see you always. Thank you. Good How to see you too. In Michigan? We don't have any snow. It's so weird. So wait, Redmond got snow and Michigan didn't get any snow. Right. Right. Send it all over here. I love it. <laughs> all right. Anyone else? All right. Well, we will. Slide. We will advance the slide. We will attempt to advance the slide. I'm on the team's inner rings, so uh, life gets interesting sometimes. There we go. OK, so uh, the big intro here, we have Lisa Elser, who is a, a really astonishing person. Sometimes I just I meet people in, in the darndest places and we just started talking. She started talking about all of the things that she done in tech and then about being a gemologist and gem cutter. And I'm going, OK, I, I, I just need to get like the whole story of this and, and Women IT Pros is a great place to do this. So 20 plus years in tech, starting with technical writing and running the gamut through all sorts of things like uh, you know, data center management, and then to suddenly come into the, the gem world and have a gem in the Smithsonian collection. So we've got all of your social media there and those links are all clickable. So I definitely encourage you to check her out. And Lisa, I'm going to turn things over to you and please tell us your IT story. OK, so. You know, I'm 61 years old, growing up in the in the 60s. Um, nobody in my family had a STEM background. My dad was the first one to go to college. It was a family of immigrants. Um, he did a business degree and became a sales guy for New Jersey Bell. Uh, my mom was high school diploma housewife. I'm the oldest in the family and the only girl. And I got, I'm, I'm severely dyslexic. So I got wrong answers in math, which meant I just got tracked out. And there was no, there was nobody to look at for what would a STEM career look like. I had no idea. So I went through school doing literature and languages. And the plan was to finish my PhD and go teach. And because I was absolutely dead broke through college, I worked construction. So in the early 80s, I was actually an apprentice grade carpenter. I worked construction, putting myself through school. And when I got out of school, I had a couple years of teaching English under my belt when I was in university. I had a construction background and I wound up getting a job writing about construction for the insurance industry. And I started doing that and I lasted nine months. It was a girl ghetto. I worked for a company called AW Best, which or AM Best, which was that they are the right the underwriter's guide. There were no men except for the department head in publishing. There were no women in underwriting analysis. It, it was absolutely a girl ghetto. And I made it nine months. I have never been so bored in my life. And I got out and I got a job as a tech writer for Bell Laboratories. And this was early 85. And tech writing now is quite different. Uh, you generally get a bunch of specs and you revise the specs and that's it. We got thrown into the lab. So I was 23 years old and I get thrown into the lab with this wonderful man who was at the time, I think younger than I am now, but he was one of the lead test engineers and he sits me down and he says, okay, so what's your background? Computer science? No. Math, double E? No medieval and classical literature. And he looked at me and he stopped and he said, we can do this. Let's move to a room with a whiteboard. And that's what we did. We moved to a room with a whiteboard and he started explaining stuff and I started writing about it. And bless that man, because if he'd said, I can't work with you, which he was entitled to do, I would have been done probably. But I found out I was actually quite good at it. And I, I get bored easily. Uh, my my late husband said, you're a border collie. If you don't have a job, you'll chew my shoes. So I was always sort of, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What do I want to do? And over a couple years as a tech writer, I started really learning Unix. And I'm still a Unix girl. Um, I'm sorry, Microsoft, I'm a Unix girl. But the, I began digging down. And at the time, 
Uh, we didn't have WYSIWYG stuff. We did encoding into the documents to get them formatted. And I started working on programming tear off macros to do the encoding so that I could create those. And I just kept kind of learning as I went along. And I wound up in a documentation group within a system test organization for another part of the lab. And I was a contractor, I was not an employee. And one morning they called me in and I, I went down to the cafeteria with my boss and one of the engineers and they said, if you had to give up tech writing and be a test engineer today, would you do it? And I was terrified, I said, well, this is but I said yes. And it turned out they had to lay off the writers, but they wanted to keep somebody who could write because I made them sound smart. So they laid off five writers and one test engineer and they moved me into test engineer. And that was the end of it. Um, I was now officially a test engineer. But I had been doing some sysadmin. I'd been running the uh, Unix boxes for the writers. I'd been programming our tear off macros. I had been doing all of that work. So I just moved in and kept doing it. And over the years, you know, I, I got approached. I was doing data center, the system administration for a data center group within what was at that time Unix System Labs, which was part of Bell Labs. And was told, well, we want you to become an employee and we're going to cut your salary in half and we're going to drop you down effectively two levels and we're going to send you back for a second master's degree and then we'll promote you. I'm like, there's nothing in this for me. <laughs> I'm just not doing this. And I lasted another six months or so and then I went and got another contract. Uh, when I was finishing my master's, um, before that contract, I finished my master's in medieval and classical literature in 1990 and kind of took my master's and ran. I decided at that point I owned a home. I had a really good career. I wasn't going to finish my PhD and go teach. I was going to take my master's and run. But I was sitting at, at lunch and my my boss was at the table and he said, again, I'm a contractor. I'm not an employee. They're not paying for my degree. And he said, well, so couple more weeks, you'll have a master's in computer science. Did, um, Mark, did I ever mention computer science? No. Why? What? So I told him and I took a couple days off. I finished my master's examinations. I came back to work and I got laid off. Because he literally couldn't get it through his head that I, he knew I was good at what I did. I was the lead test engineer for, for that section of the product. And I got laid off two weeks, I mean, laid off a month before we went to release. So I got stopped in the cafeteria by the product manager and he said, is there anything we could do to keep you? Like, yeah, you could tell Mark not to lay me off. And he actually started cursing and stomped off. And about an hour later, my boss came into my office, closed the door and said, if you tell people you're leaving to use your degree, I'll give you a really good reference. I'm like, All right. Uh, so it wasn't a question of my work. It was that some people could not get past it. But I always found enough places that could. And the thing I found was a lot of people who had much better technical cred than I did were afraid of learning new things. They were afraid of, because when you say, I don't know that I need to learn it, you become very vulnerable. And be, I think partly because of, of my nature and partly because I didn't have any technical credit to begin with, I, I didn't have that. So you go, oh, okay, I'll learn that. I don't know that. How does it work? And sorry about that. When an awful lot of people were kind of holding on to old tech and particularly in sysadmin, that happens a lot. You know, I know this stuff and it's never going to die. And I know these systems and I can keep doing this till I die. And I was always like, well, what's the next thing? And because I, I was a consultant for most of my early career, I was like, well, I always need to be looking for the next job. So it was like, okay, well, I, I just took a new contract. What can I learn in this contract that's going to make me more valuable for the next contract? And so generally at least at that time in the in the AT&T and Bell Labs consulting world you lasted about two years and then they decided you were very expensive or they wanted an employee doing the work and so you had about so I always figured I had two years to learn new things um, 
I moved to Europe in 90, early 93 and stayed in Finland for almost two years and came back. And it was the weirdest thing because at that point I had really good career experience under my belt. I figured I'd be very employable. I might as well have been in a Buddhist monastery for those two years. The, 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 the fact that I had been in Helsinki meant that nobody wanted to talk to me at all. Could not get a job doing this. This been, I wound up getting one consulting offer to run a, a test organization for a startup that was going to be almost full-time travel and 100-hour weeks and no support. And I had just married my husband. I'm like, I don't want to do that. So we mapped out. I still owned a home. I wasn't ready to give up. Um, and Tom and I mapped out, like, what's the least amount of money I can make and still cover my bills? Because I didn't want to be dependent. And okay, if that's the least amount of money I can make and do it, what new thing do I want to do? Because clearly I can't step back into what I was doing. And I wound up moving into sales engineering. And I took a fairly junior level job compared to what I'd been doing in sales engineering. And I found out I absolutely loved it. And within a year, I was back to earning what I'd been earning before I left the country. And, and they brought me on board as an employee, which was astonishing because I still didn't have a tech master's. And, but I got to teach and I got to, you know, you're in the sales side, you're always having to learn new things because the product's always changing. And you're, you're having to muzzle the sales rep because they're saying things which are not true and they're selling things which do not exist. So, you know, the old joke about paint a rabbit gray and sell it as a laptop elephant. Um, <laughs> you know, so so I, I had to use a lot of people's skills. I had to use a lot of learning skills. Um, but the main thing that I had to do was connect the values. So what was the client trying to do and how could we make that happen better? So for me, it was a great collection of skills I had, skills I needed to build. I am a pretty blunt instrument. And so I needed to learn about, you know, filters, um, not saying that's a really terrible idea, that's not gonna work, uh, which I could do in harder tech and I couldn't do in sales engineering. I had to, I had to steer it better. Um, but all the things that I brought to the table from, you know, my years of, of teaching, because I taught all through the time I was in university and grad school, even when I was working in tech, um, all the things I knew technically, all the things I knew about learning came to bear in sales engineering. And that's what I wound up doing for the rest of my career. I started that in 94 and went to work for Sun Microsystems, which, you know, for a lot of years was a fabulous place to work. And in the sales engineering side, 20% of my time was expected to be spent in research. So I was able to publish and I was able to go to California and do research and write papers. So I published on tuning Sybase for our operating system. I published on how to actually use and administer our E10K systems. Uh, which I loved. I loved getting to write. I loved getting to still be in the lab and do things. Um, and then we moved to Switzerland in 99. Uh, Tom had worked for Bell Labs. Um, he needed to keep his 30 years. He needed to get 30 years. And I had moved back from Finland to marry him on the condition that we get the fuck out of the United States as soon as we were able to do it. I would move back but I wanted out and so did he. So when he left Bell Labs um, in 95, excuse me, he left Bell Labs in 97, he actually came to work for Sun. And in 99, we both transferred to take tech jobs in Switzerland, working in the sales organizations there. And Switzerland was interesting because I was assumed to be a secretary in Switzerland. And at one point, you know, well, of course, I, I was hired because they wanted Tom and they moved me over into a secretarial role, right? And 
I had to go up and correct. I was I was actually put in the org code for the secretaries on our little contact sheet. And I went up and said, you know, that's it's not correct. I have the same job as Harold, but the same as Dr. von Fellenberg. <laughs> yeah. So I got myself, I still lived in Switzerland, but I moved into the regional organization. I I could not work in the Swiss organization. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely impossible to do it. Um, so I wound up covering Southern Europe, Africa, Middle East, which was fun because I was not only the highest ranking woman engineer in the region, I was also a native speaker of English, which meant I kept getting you know field promotions. Um, in the military, if somebody shot, they promote somebody in the field. And I used to get a field promotion because they didn't want to fly someone out from California, New York to speak. So they'd send me to Istanbul to give the talk um, and give me a promotion title for the talk. So I was able to travel all over the place, which was a whole different level of learning because there were very small things like how you dress in Budapest is not how you dress in Milan. So I would have to look up and go, you know, that I couldn't wear a necklace like this in Budapest, but I could certainly wear it in Milan. Um, Eastern Europe, people sold their jewelry to buy food. Wearing jewelry was extremely rude. You could wear a wedding ring and maybe a little pair of earrings, but you didn't wear ostentatious jewelry. Um, South Africa, you still dressed like it was the 50s, pretty much. You know, you did cover it up. Where Italy, I could wear uh, tighter clothes, a lower cut. Um, how you... I, I was out to dinner with somebody who worked for me in Istanbul and I had a little bit of a cold. So I'm, you know, discreetly tapping my nose. It turns out that is basically the equivalent of wiping your butt if you do that at the table. <laughs> so I had all of these now, these cultural things that I had to learn before I showed up in a place. And just to be successful in the place, I had to learn that. So that was always part of the fun for me. And I wound up getting, you know, I got promoted to the point where I wasn't doing anything technical anymore, which I didn't like very much. Uh, but I got promoted over a group of absolute wizards. Uh, these people were amazeballs. And they had been managed very, very badly for a long time. So I was brought in to fix it. And the problem for me was it was not my area of technical expertise. I was now running the business wear division for... Um, our professional services group. So I had a team of people who were experts in SAP and Oracle apps and PeopleSoft, and I know these from nothing. This is not a thing I had ever done. So I wound up going in and saying, okay, I know some stuff. I do, you know, I have a technical background. I've been doing this for years. I know nothing about what you do. What do you need? What does the company need? Because their job was to actually build the programs that would make us successful in those spaces. Um, you know, they would be get sold out to debug things. The, the, you know, they had problems with the South African energy group and somebody gets shipped down to South Africa. But by and large, we were supposed to make the overarching structure for everybody to be able to do it and to build the materials for local people to roll these out and be successful. Um, I go, okay, what do you need? What's going to work? And we wound up building three different programs that got rolled out internationally to do that. And before I joined the group, they had never rolled out a program at all because they kept getting effectively sold into slavery. And their bosses kept thinking they knew better what was needed. And I knew I didn't know better what we needed. And I was able to get out of their way and give them the support and do things. Um, and I, did, I didn't learn that specific tech, but I did learn about it enough to talk intelligently about it. Um, so that's really always been, and that was the, um, the company sort of dissolved. Um, things got ugly. I wound up leaving Europe for a whole lot of reasons and moving back to, we moved to Seattle I took over the sales engineering group for one of our software divisions um, and again was in a position where I was managing a group of wizards and I did not know their tech specifically um, and managed to pull that into pretty good shape. And that's the job I retired from in 2006. Um, I was 45. 
I was 20 pounds lighter than I am now, and I'm not terribly huge now. I had chronic bronchitis. I kept breaking out hives. My manager was one of the worst human beings I had ever met. And, you know, I literally spent all my time protecting my staff from my own management, which was really hard. So at that point, I had been, when, when they moved me out of a, a technical role, and I spent all my time on conference calls and doing politics, I'd been a hand weaver, and I started building this sort of fantasy life of what will I do next? And my hobby at that point, I, I was a hand weaver, but you can't really make money at hand weaving. You know, it's not a thing. Uh, but I'd started doing some gem cutting for fun. I thought, well, I could, I could do that. And the good gem places are also good bird watching and scuba places. So that, well, that would be fun because now I can write it off. Like we can, we can go to Madagascar and I can write it off, which is exactly what I did. Um, started the business in 2002, um, went full time in early 2007. And that's what I've been doing. And Tom was a research mathematician, so he began doing gem designs to bend light in the way we wanted to bend light. And I went and did a gemological degree and built the business. We built our own database. But part of what let us build, turn this hobby into a business was we had the technical skills to build a database to run the business and the business skills to run a business. I, you know, I do my accounting. I can, I can give a quote and keep to a time and do all those other things that people coming out of more of a craft perspective uh, can't necessarily do. So it's, it's turned from, you know, it was supposed to be keeping me busy and getting us to different countries into keeping me busy, getting me to different countries and paying the bills, which is kind of cool. And as Kathy said, I do, I have a piece in the Smithsonian, which I would have taped one to the back of a, of a washroom toilet, right? Like I did just say I had a gem in the Smithsonian. So it's, that's never not going to be great to, to, to feel. Um, but I think that the, the ability to get my own ego out of the way and pivot to do something new and to plan something new and to think about a new, what's the next thing I want to do so that I don't get bored. Um, and realistically, it had much less to do with, I want to push back the frontiers of science. Uh, Tom and I used to joke about that, that you were going over to push, push back the frontiers of science. What we were really doing was try not to get bored. I can't imagine sitting in the same job for 20 years. I shame myself. Um, I lasted two, two and a half years and I stayed with the same company. You know, I stayed with, with Bell Labs in different roles for many, many years. Uh, Tom was at AT&T for 30 years and about every two years he would move into a different area and do something new and learn something new. And I did the same thing. Um, I was with Sun for 11 years and I lasted about two years in a role and then I'd move up and out and in and do something different. And so that's just my, that's my tolerance. That's how long I can last at something without needing to, to learn something new. And not everybody's wired that way, and this is not a better way to be wired. But I think it helped me go from, you know, being told I was bad at technology, I was bad at math, I was bad at science. Nobody wants me building their bridge. They really don't. Nobody wants me designing circuit boards. I'm still dyslexic. And when I was working on, on finance for my MBA, uh, because my husband was a mathematician, I would periodically look at him and I'm like, I'm getting the right answer, but I don't know how this works. And he'd think for a minute and go, okay, and he'd explain it. And other times he'd think for a minute and go, you need two years of background math so you don't have, just keep getting the right answer. I'm like, all right. Uh, there's things I can't do because I don't have the background math, because I don't have the engineering. Uh, when my husband was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is a, a blood cancer, I knew from nothing. So I decided the best thing I could do was learn as much as I could. And I threw myself into hematological cancer research. Uh, now I was not doing research, I was reading research, but I had a couple of friends who were doctors who coached me and it was sort of dialing for support to figure stuff out. And about two years, three years in, my family doctor said, you know, you are the best amateur hematologist in the lower mainland. Thank you. <laughs> you know this stuff. And I was just nominated, I'll know later this month, by one of the researchers here um, for a board of directors position at Myeloma Canada. 
So I've never stopped learning and doing it again. Nobody wants me designing drugs. Nobody wants me developing protocols for cancer treatment, but I can talk intelligently. I speak moderately fluent doctor. Um, and I joke about it being borehole knowledge because if you get me on, like it's something Tom had, I know it to a very deep level. I know the research, I know the clinical trials, I know the trade-offs of various things, I understand the adverse effects, I'm good. If it's not something Tom had, I got nothing. You got boils, man, I got nothing. Um, your kid's got a cold, I cannot help you. You have myeloma or MDS, I'm on it. Um, but that really is, that is my wiring and it's never, I mean, I, I tell people that if you learn how to learn things, it will, it will, you can learn almost anything to the point where it does you good. And, you know, I know, I, I, I asked Tom at one point, like, do you think I could do math? He said, no, no, I don't think so. I said, okay, why? And at this point I'm 35, he says, well, you're too old. Mathematicians are done by 35. You're too old to be a mathematician. I'm like, I'm not asking if I can be a freaking mathematician. I'm asking if I can like do linear algebra. But oh, of course you can. So, <laughs> you know, I am my own worst critic on all of this stuff. And it's really just a question of where do I want to put my energy? I have nothing to prove. If I never learn to do linear algebra, I will die a happy woman. It's, it's not a need that I have. But I no longer think I can't learn to do it. I don't have a need to learn to do it. I didn't think I could learn um, hematology. I'm not bad. I, I have had very good in-depth conversations with hematologists and made it work. So I just don't have a sense anymore that there's something I can't learn to the point where it's useful to me. And that's really a gift. I, I wouldn't have told you that. 20 years ago, let alone growing up. Um, I'm now doing silly things like the, we were bird watchers. My husband was a terrific nature photographer and I was told I was bad at art. So now I draw birds and I draw pretty freak incredible birds. Um, I'm having a very good time with it. It's a bird. It's a decent bird. Um, so it's kind of like, all right, I'm going to try doing something I was told I was bad at and see if I'm actually bad at it or if people just told me that. And more often than not, I'm not bad at it. So it has been a lot of fun. And that it's, that's my goofy little career. So if folks have questions or if there's anything that doesn't make sense or sounds ridiculous, it probably is. Well, I want to go back to, oh, I, so I started cutting gems. I mean, how does somebody just start cutting gems? It's not like you just go down to Ben Franklin, you know, the craft store. <laughs> Well, we were, again, I was, we were living in Switzerland and our territory was Southern Europe, Africa, Middle East. So we wound up in Prague for work. And, and what we'd often try to do is, you know, if one of us had to go do a, a work event, the other would try to fly in if it was an interesting place. So we'd, we'd get some time. So we're walking around Prague and I see this necklace that I fall in love with. And it's a thousand euros, which is a bunch of money. It is, they tell me it's it's gold and sapphires, like a station necklace. I'm in Eastern Europe in an antique store. There's no way I'm spending a thousand euros on something in an Eastern European antique store. I don't know what it is. So it distressed me that I could not buy the necklace. It distressed me a lot because I liked the necklace. And I got home and I started Googling. I'm like, is there some way I could know whether that was really gold and gems? Because I don't know. For all I know, you've got to send it off to a, a huge lab to find that out. I've got nothing. And I found there was somebody in Montreux in southern Switzerland who taught um, jewelry making and gem cutting and gemology. I'm like, hmm. And I couldn't take three days off work to do the gemology class, but I could take a day to do the gem cutting class. So I got up at five in the morning and I drove to Montreux and I spent eight hours and I cut a gem. And I left with my, my little 10 millimeter Danburite in a round brilliant, like, that's what I'm gonna do. It was absolutely this, I'm going to do that. And that's what I did. I went back and I took more classes with him. I decided, because my job at that point 
really sucked. The company was not doing well, and when a company is not doing well, the politics get ugly. Um, I was a foreigner living in Switzerland. My German was just fine, but I was never going to be Swiss. And I was getting pushed out of things. Um, I was in a situation where the, it, it's son at the time, you couldn't be promoted to director. They had to create a director job for you. So they created a director job for me. And it was a done deal. I was moving into the director job. It was, you know, massive. Like again, they had to create a director slot. They couldn't just promote you to that level. So there it is. There's my director slot. I'm living in Switzerland. Where to go? We moved under a new VP who said, I don't know her, but my friend Nigel needs a director job. And my slot literally got handed to this asshole. Pardon my French. And it was like somebody died. I had spent two years working my ass off for this job. They, they created the position for me and I lost it. And that was the point where Tom and I said, we're out. We're going to move back to the States. We'll take a job in, back in sales rather than corporate. We'll forget it. And he retired. He, he retired when he left Switzerland. He took a package. And I moved to Seattle and started running the West Coast for our software division. But it really was that wake up of the company's not going to do anything for me ever. And through through that really awful emotional time, I built this fantasy because we'd put in for Canadian immigration. We didn't want to go back to the US. We'd put in for immigration to Canada. And like I'm going to be a jeweler in Vancouver. So I'm on conference calls and I'm practicing gem pickups with tweezers with my right and left hands. And I'm like doing all of this stuff. And I had this huge fantasy life and I started like learning gemology and cutting things. And then I was actually able to do it. But that fantasy sustained me through some really terrible career moments of just, you know, I mean, I was, I was making very good money, but my day-to-day -day life was terrible. And uh, I had surrendered the idea of having a career. It was like, I'm going to leaving corporate where I could get promoted and going back into sales engineering meant I was on a sales incentive plan. And when I left Switzerland and came to Seattle, I actually in the sales, the sales engineering side in management was making as much as Tom and I together had made in Switzerland. So I was able to just go basically screw it. I'm going to take all the money I can take and I'm getting out. And it's what I did. I packaged out two years later. We got the we got our Canadian immigration, we got the house paid off, I packaged out. So the gem cutting was really this thing that I did as a hobby that wound up being a thing I could do as what I thought was gonna be, you know, a little pay for itself hobby and I could write off trips to Tanzania, Madagascar, or Brazil, do these things. And it turned out I'm good at it, I like it, we built a pretty good business. That's amazing. So I, I have tons of questions, but I'll open it up first. If anyone else has questions, you can come off mute. Uh, you can type them in the chat window. You can raise your hand or not raise your hand, whatever. Thanks for sharing your story. That's awesome. You're awesome. I think oh, that's so cool. <laughs> like, it's just amazing all the things that you've done in your career and your life. It's, it's really cool. I get bored um, easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally relate to that. Even the math thing like I'm horrible at math and for the longest I I've kind of just I don't know if I can learn it anymore I I feel even like simple math I I'm like oh I shy away from it but I think like you said you can learn anything if you you know if you want to and yeah then, uh, it, 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 nobody's ever going to have me doing mathematical research yeah. <laughs> if I need to learn this I can learn it to the, the level yeah. I, I need to Exactly. And it's like, I, I think I don't want it to be something to hold me back. Like, I can't do this because it's just out of my, like, possibilities or realm of possibilities for me. So, I mean, it's good to hear, especially, you know, you've had, a, like, your career, you've done a lot of really like, cool things. And, yeah. I, you know, it's just so, it's just so awesome. Um, have you ever experienced, like, imposter syndrome in oh, any God. of your, <laughs> have you dealt with that? Syndrome had imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> And that, and I can say with, again, I'm 61 years old. I no longer have it. But I remember I was driving my, my job, um, my last job in Switzerland where I managed a group of wizards. 
I had to drive from Zurich up to um, Waldorf, which is where SAP has had, has a headquarters, and we had our, our lab there. And so I would go up there every two weeks or so. And I had taken the group over from some people who did have SAP knowledge, but were really, really, really crappy people. And they treated my staff very badly. And I wasn't part of their team. And I wasn't allowing my staff to be sold into slavery to make them look good. And so they didn't like me very much. And and I would literally get woken up at 11 o'clock at night by somebody coming out of a meeting in California saying, you know, Stefan was here and he's talking really he's talking crap about you. And I'm like, I, I can't. So I was constantly being being bad mouthed and put down and, and done for. And at one point I'm, I'm driving up and all of a sudden, like the light goes off in my head and I pulled off the road into a rest area and I called my husband. I'm like, I'm really good at my job. He went, yeah. I said, no, no, I just got it. I'm really, like I'm exceptionally good at this. And if I don't say it out loud, I'll forget. And so that was kind of the first moment of me really bypassing and, and, and getting out of that imposter syndrome. Because again, I changed positions or I changed roles every two years or so. So I would just about figure I'm really good at this and I would start doing something else. And I'd have to build that back up again. Um, one of the, the benefits for me of, you know, a combination of age and tragedy, I lost my husband. My husband died in my arms. What the fuck are you going to do to scare me? So it's a nice feeling to go, yeah, no, I'm really good at this. Uh, when I first, when, when, when the piece was taken into the Smithsonian, if, you, if you've seen the Ikea ad where the woman's carrying bags running to the car because she thinks she stole everything, it was so cheap. That's how I left the Smithsonian's booth. <laughs> Get me out of here before they give it back. Um, Three museums later, I'm going, no, actually, I deserve to be here. Like, here's my stuff in this other stuff. It's just as good. Um, but I know what I can't do. And that's the other thing is I don't have to be as good as anybody else. I don't have to be at that level. Um, I'm very comfortable not being at that level because what I do is more than good enough. Um, I have a, a dear friend who... Uh, she has really bad people skills, but she's a lovely human being. And she does art jewelry, you know, wins all the awards and does all the stuff and loses a ton of money every year doing it. So we're, we're at the Tucson Gem Shows and I pick her up at the gallery where she's exhibiting and she says, you know, if you do four or five important pieces, I can get you into this gallery. I'm like, no, I mean, have you ever sold anything at that gallery? She says, no, but it's, it's wonderful exposure. So I told her what I make in a year. I said, you know, I, like, I make a real living at this. And I sell pieces in the 500 to 1,000 range all day long. And I make an actual living. And here's what I earned last year. And her jaw dropped. I'm like, I don't need to be in a gallery. Like, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not chasing other people's recognition. I'm very okay. happy doing what I do. I have a nice niche, but I didn't get that in my 40s. I got that in my 50s. Like, it, 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 that's a later life feeling of being confident in it. So yeah, I. I spent a big chunk of my life going, I understand, you know, hello brain, you feel like you're faking it, you're not, shut up, sit down. Um, yeah, that's, that's really, like, thank you so much for sharing your story and for, you know, you're amazing. <laughs> I think that's really, that's just something that I've struggled with is imposter syndrome and I think it's just talking myself out of it. So, I mean, gives me hope. Yeah. For, not having that in the future, like dealing with it better than I have before, for sure. Well, and you know, my, my husband had this way that worked for me that might not work for other people, but he knew that just reassuring some me 
did work because I'm probably not going to believe you. But he could do things like my mom was bulimic. And so I grew up always having that you're too fat, you're too fat to your, you're too fat. And he would look at me when I'd start spinning out and be like, it's that one pound right there. It's disgusting. The rest is fine. <laughs> and, and it would make me laugh about it. <laughs> yeah. And like he could do that in a work context too. He'd be like, yeah, you know, that sentence, pretty fucking dumb. <laughs> rest of the paper's great. And, 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 and he could get me laughing so that I could see how ridiculous I was being with it. And I was really fortunate to have that. Um, and we, we had a little rule at home because we did work for the same company. We did work in the same areas. We wanted each other's opinion. So we would review each other's work. And whoever was being reviewed got to be an asshole. <laughs> and, no, I'm not doing that. That makes no sense. You don't know what you're talking about. And whoever did the reviewing would then leave for a couple hours so that the review had time to percolate. And we could come back and go, yeah, yeah, that was a really good idea. I changed my paper right here. Uh, so we sort of, we, we consciously built structures to get around our own brain weasels uh, and to make sure that we could do that. And that's a hard thing to do with work colleagues because you can't really admit to the brain weasels. It's an easier right. thing to do if you have a network of friends who, yes. or, or part of you can say, you know what, this is, this is where my own brain gets in my way. Can you help me get past it? That's true. I love that, though. I love that you guys did that. Am I muted? I'm muted really slow. There it goes, I think. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so we do have a, a really good Women IT Pros call on Vanishing Imposter Syndrome by Donna Sarkar. We did back in September of 2019, so I'll put the link in the chat window. I'll put the link in the uh, the um, uh, YouTube posting when we post this video. But you know, one of the things that she really talks about is the importance of having the people around you. And it sounds like Tom was really, you know, someone for you, Lisa, who who was there and was able to, you know, kind of fill that that role of, you know, reality check of yeah, when we do need something, and and no, and we're we're actually doing fine. See, Lisa, are you frozen? Does anyone else see you're frozen? Yeah, I think so. Oh no, we may have lost her. We'll get her back, I promise. Are you there? I bet that's her. There she is. Hey, welcome back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> eh, teams, it happens. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. So we still have a few more minutes. Other questions or comments, discussion? One of the things I was wondering is, so you talked about being dyslexic, and yet, you know, I think a lot of us just have the idea, oh, if you're dyslexic, it means you can't read. And that, you know, it's just, like people simplify it down to, oh, you just reverse things. But I'm assuming, given how you've investigated everything else, that you've probably learned quite a bit about your dyslexia. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and so, how you manage it. So I I know, like, and, and of course, I, I speak German. I'm working on Swahili. I spoke decent Italian for a while. I, um, I know that I will not pronounce things correctly because I will not necessarily see the letters in the right order. So it doesn't interfere with my reading, uh, but I'll get the letters in the wrong order. Uh, in, the, in the days of typing, I used to have a housemate proofread my stuff to make sure I didn't get anything wrong. Um, I may literally see the, the letters in the wrong order and therefore pronounce it in the wrong way. Um, I will not remember how to spell things. Uh, um, I have no real concept of left and right. I'm aware they exist as a thing, but but so Tom used to be like, turn to the watch, because the watch was always on the left. Um, when I rode dressage, where left and right matter, I had two different color gloves. 
So I had a, a right look, look and I could kind of remember and look at my hands and see where I was going. Um, the, but if I'm doing a line of numbers, I'll put a ruler underneath them I'll boom, 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 um, to make sure that I have that extra little catch. It never interfered with my reading. I, I read from the time I was four. Um, it, it interfered with my ability to see the word for what the word was. Hmm. So I, I might pronounce it wrong. I might actually be mistake if two words are close together, particularly in another language, I might actually think the wrong thing. Like I might think we're talking about baskets when we're talking about boxes if they're close together. Um, but the real place it hit me was, of course, if I'm supposed to calculate something, I'm going to get the wrong answer if I don't see the numbers in the right order, if I don't see the right number. So that was really the place that threw me out. Um, but, you know, my handwriting is appalling. My handwriting is absolutely horrible because it was a way to disguise my bad spelling. So, and, and that would, having bad handwriting wasn't very feminine. So I got sent to do the Palmer method over and over and over. And so, you know, I'm hiding the fact that I can't tell whether it's I versus E or E versus I or. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the place it holds me back is, and when I was coming up in tech, current development tools did not exist. You typed the code into a window and you compiled it with make. So if you can't see, the, if, if you can't make sure that things are in the right order, you can't write code. There's nothing checking you except does it make or not. But one of the side effects of that was I can debug like a sumbitch. So it's one of the reasons I did really well in test because yes. I can probably break it. I could probably debug it, but I can't write it. So I've never written code. Um, I've written some scripts, but but I've never been a coder. We didn't have tools that would cover for my dyslexia. I had to physically type things in and compile them, and it just doesn't work for me. And you're a perfect example. You know, we say you don't have to code to work in tech. And, you know, a lot of times I think people want to dismiss the things beyond coding as not technical, but everything that you're describing you know, to me, seems incredibly technical. I just I, wondered, like, how I, do you I design think large scale data warehouse systems for governments? It's technical. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, do you have a definition of technical, or you like, how do you think of technical? You know, I, I actually don't. Um, I have no, I'm, I make no apologies for the fact that I had a 30 year career in tech. And I did hardcore technical work, and my name is on some papers about doing stuff that was technical. Um, the the very there is there is one true way to be technical, and a lot of it is it is extreme gatekeeping, and it's gatekeeping in the way that gamer culture has gatekeeping. It's gatekeeping in the way that a lot of cultures have gatekeeping. Um, fuck the gate. I can. I can hire a monkey to write code. I really can. I can AI's hire now. a five-year-old to write code if I need code written, and, and I can debug it. Uh, <laughs> what, what I've always valued and what I've always been, been paid for more than the guy writing, and it, no shame on people who code. There's some really amazing people. My husband could write unbelievable code. Uh, I can be here, and I can see how everything comes together. And I can see how it makes a difference for the end client. Mm -hmm. And that if, if you write code that nobody can use, what good is that? If you if if you can't see the business value in what's being done, what what value is it? Uh, so being able to say, right, I can I can do that. And that is absolutely technical. Uh, I got what my interview for Sun. They said, so I see you do a lot of system tuning, uh, database tuning. What parameters would you tune in the OS for IO? And I'm like, I don't know, uh, but that isn't what I said. What I said was, you know, if I'm working on a database, I'm not going to tune the kernel 
to improve IO performance, I'm going to look at my storage because mostly the storage is so poorly laid out that you're not going to get any benefit out of the kernel. And they hired me because that was the right answer. And it was completely a cover for the fact that I had I could not remember what kernel parameters I would tune to do that. So, <laughs> you know, answer the question you can answer. Turn the question into one that you can effectively answer that makes sense for them. And yeah. don't stress about the fact that you don't remember the name of that parameter. Brilliant. Um, any last questions from anybody? No? Um, Lisa, any parting word? Anything you want to sum nope, up? Thank or? you very much for inviting me. This was fun. This was amazing. Yeah, so I think everybody here is having the same reaction I had when I first met you standing <laughs> in her friend's kitchen going, oh my gosh, I have to get this woman. Because you know, it's stories like these, I think, that really help us see the, the breadth and the possibility, and and especially with with the gem cutting and the gemology, to see that even beyond tech, you know, transferring these skills into other things is is so much of a possibility that you know we we don't need to just limit ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, just real quick, thank running you, through what we have coming up for Women IT Pros. Um, so remember our Asia Pacific meeting is Thursday, December 29th at noon in Brisbane, which is 6 p.m. Pacific time on the 28th. Uh, we will be back with our US meeting uh, in alt space on Friday, December 9th from 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific time. And then join us back here on Friday, January 13th, 9 a.m. We'll have Holly Lehman talking about another amazing journey in tech. And if you know people who have amazing journeys and didn't start off in, you know, the STEM or traditional places, send them my way because we definitely want to feature them here on Women IT Pros. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Thank you. Bye.